on this computer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for all that you've allowed into our lives this past year, the good and the hard things that have reminded us how much we need you and to continually rely on your presence each day. We pray for your spirit to lead our steps. We ask that you guide our decisions and turn our hearts to deeply desire you above all else. We ask that you will open doors needing to be opened and close the ones needing to be shut tight. We ask that you would help us release our grip on the things in which you said no, not yet, or wait. We ask for help to pursue you first about above every dream and desire you've put within our hearts. We ask for your wisdom, strength, and power to be consistently present within us. We pray you would make us strong and courageous for the road ahead. Give us the ability beyond what we feel able to let, to let your gifts flow freely through us so that you would be honored by our lives and others would be drawn to you. We pray that you'd keep us far from the snares and traps of temptation, that you would whisper in our ear when we need to run and whisper in our heart when we need to stand our ground. We pray for your protection over our families, friends, and anyone who listens to this podcast. We ask for your hand to cover us and to keep us distance from the enemy's evil intent, that you would be a barrier to surround us, that we'd be safe in your hands. We pray that you would give us discernment and insight beyond our years to understand your will, hear your voice, and know your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Save Our Children podcast. We're your hosts, Becky and Bridget, and it has been a hot minute since we have been on this podcast. I think we're looking at, what, like eight, nine months since yep. we've been podcasting. We took a step back, wanted to focus on family and church and local, and the podcast now, we're actually in season three. This year is our third third season that we're starting. And we wanted to come back, but we're going to have it look a little bit different um, than what we have in the past, more of really just Bridget and I talking about what we're doing locally, how the people we've met, the things we've done, um, the different ways that we're helping our community, and then really allowing you, the listener, to find where those things may serve your community, or if you're in our area, to come join us. Um whatever it is, but we want, we went from how to help our kids, how to help the the larger group. Um, and that's, that's great. If you haven't listened to episodes one through 90, there is a wealth of information <laughs> in there. You can always go back and listen to it. We're blessed that we were able to capture all that, but now we're going to kind of focus on what we're doing now, where we are and what we've done over the past eight, nine, 10 months since we've, since we've been, been on here. Quickly, for those who are just happening to catch this new season, this new um, this new episode, if you haven't heard our story, quick recap. In 2020, um, we both started following a survivor on Instagram, a friend of ours outside that we both followed, recognized that we are both in the Phoenix, Arizona area, and connected us together. There was... Um, I think there was a march at the Capitol. Wasn't that what happened? Something like that, that we were all kind of doing. And and we were able to get together in January of 2021. We decided we were going to, we never met each other, but we were going to road trip <laughs> up to Sedona to check some stuff out um, and hit it off since then. And we've been friends and business partners and podcast hosts for the last over two and a half years. And it's been fantastic. I don't know where two and a half years has gone, uh, <laughs> but it's been awesome. So that's how we get to like this point here. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of months. We've been to, we've been together. We go to church together. <laughs> like we've been together on the backside. We just haven't been out here publicly. And to, with that being said, I want to thank everyone. We both have seen our notifications come in for the podcast. 
us. And truly it, from day one, it's been God driven and every step of the way we've walked in our faith and it's been quite the journey, spiritual journey for sure. And there's been ups and downs and thankfully by the grace of God, we've pull, gotten pulled out of so many situations and redirected in so many situations where at times we didn't know the answers of why we were getting pulled certain ways. And at one point you even saw where the podcast took a break and P and it was like, even for me, it was like, it broke and it was like, oh my gosh, what's next? Because of everyone, it was always like, I was the one who was like, hey, one more podcast, one more podcast. And one thing that Becky stayed true to was definitely the boundary of schedule and routine and saying family, faith, family, and then how do we balance this? Especially because we both had made such a impact in the very beginning, we agreed that we would be doing podcasting, going hard straight for the first year. And so year two and season two looked a little bit different and we got to see ups and downs with that. And with that, we also all got pulled in different journeys, but at the same time, we all had our own things going on between family, work, lifestyle, and spiritually. And so that's one thing that you will see in our podcast is if you're just now tuning into season three, I advise go back and watch season one and two because everything that's on a world stage, God gave us the strength to where we are now. And we were able to bring light to a lot of what's so dark right now, but we did it where it was a soft place to land as awareness and educational purposes, but also to elevate survivor stories. So I definitely know that when we said we are taking a break from podcasting, I was like, okay, how do I do this alone? And then I was like, this is weird. And then God literally set, sat me down and I told Becky, I was like, okay, I've got put in spiritual timeout and we really... <laughs> We really have had quite the journey since. So thank you guys for continuously tuning into the podcast, even though it's not as consecutive as it was. We definitely see the growth and are still having so many people be led to the podcast. So thank you. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I think that to me is probably the, the most interesting thing because it's not even that we were podcasting because we stopped doing that. We weren't even really sharing on our podcast page or even on our our personal pages that we had a podcast. And so again, like Bridget said, by the grace of God, it has been, we see at least 50 downloads every week. Now, again, if you're a big shot podcaster, that's like minuscule numbers, but we expected zero. Mm -hmm. And so to see numbers continually grow and and people see them is is an absolute blessing but to to piggyback off of what you said with like we saw the world stage we saw what's happening out there we talked about it we talked about it with the pandemic we talked about it with the the vaccine we talked about it with um the transgender we brought our kids in how to protect our kids and then god told us to just stop and if you look back, and this is always my favorite part is where you don't know what's happening until you get to a point and you look back and you go, holy shit, like that's really where we needed to be. And to be able to say, okay, I just needed to pause and we're going to look locally and we're going to not be caring about what people across the country hear on our podcast. And we're not going to be caring about um, reaching the masses we're going to look at our city and we're going to start doing stuff that says, how do we save our kids in our own city? And we'll do that for a while. And we weren't even, to be honest, we weren't even really talking about doing the podcast again until things kind of started blowing up and falling in place. And you're like, no way, we need to talk about this. Like we need to talk about what we're doing so that other people may have the opportunity to do the same thing. And so as you guys know, I was at at my church. 
I was helping with the human trafficking ministry. Bridget has joined me in that in that cause, which is fantastic. And in January, we had our first um, what's called Stop Traffic Walk. For us, it's the it's Dream City Where Hope Lives is the organization, and they have one on the other side of town. We brought it over to the East Valley. That was our first walk. Brought in 200 people. We were like, hey, we've never done this before. This is fantastic. We walked around the track at the neighboring school. It was awesome. It was so powerful. And then it was just little things that we did. And we knew that this last week we were going to have a conference, human trafficking conference. Um, that's where, what, two years ago, that's when we met Yaku. Yeah. And if you haven't listened to his, what well, we interviewed him three times, two, three times. Yeah he will punch you square in the nuts because he just says whatever <laughs> comes, whatever God gives him. And it is so amazing. It's awesome. Well, he was at our, our summit again this year. We brought in the founder of Rescue America that we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But it went from a 200 person walk and in six months became an 800 person conference. And we know much of that is because of the movie, The Sound of Freedom, that came out. It has absolutely driven the human trafficking movement. And to look back over the last two and a half, three years that we've been really sitting in this space, you can see how God has worked his hands in what we've done. Mm -hmm. Because he's like, hey, you guys need to be on the forefront of this. You need to have a place that that people will talk to you and know that you know what you're talking about, that you have a, a website people can go to, that you have a podcast that people can go to, that you spoke about this already, so that when these people get woken up, there's a place for, like you said, there's a soft place for them to land to be able to do this. And so just to see the growth and the movement in the local community has been astounding to me. Like it's, the coolest thing to watch when you take a step back. And my favorite thing, and it's not nice. I know it's not nice. It's not very Christian of me. My favorite thing when we're in a conference or we're anywhere is to see someone get square throat punched and they're like, I didn't know that was happening. And then you're like, welcome to the fight. Yeah, definitely agree. And I would say going off of that is even you don't know what's next in the season. And honestly, when you let go and you let God just cover you and go at that flow, life is completely different. And trying to, one thing that we'll get into as well is us to have learned how to learn how to balance our, our whole and regulate our whole nervous system. And with that is like, especially for me, not podcasting for that long at like, for me, that was hard because man, <laughs> I was always like, one more, one more. <laughs> so not podcasting that long, but then there was also a period where we weren't on social media. We unplugged completely. You would mm -hmm. see me here and there but very little. And then when I went to a straight water fast and just was Bible and water, like literally you didn't really see me on social media at all. And I was in my garden and outside and we were with family. So I think like for us, we were in a place where when we jumped into the fight, not knowing what we were fully walking into and to the depths of, we knew about it, but we didn't know what came with that when speaking mm -hmm. out on social media, we didn't know from the spiritual warfare to nonprofits to every little piece of it. We didn't know what we were up against until we experienced it. And so with that is we've grown so much. And it was for me when we were at the walk and at the very end, and just looking at Becky and was like, God brings us back together for a reason. And so just seeing and taking that moment to say, pause, stop, like literally just stop. You'll be okay. Just trust me. And so even for 
me watching Becky lead that event and be on stage and hearing survivors and everything that we've always talked about and what we wanted to see in the human trafficking and prevention, anti-human trafficking movement and prevention, just sat, uh, stepping back and seeing that. But then also we got to have a standby survivors table at that event and we were next to Red Light Rebellion. So it was it was honestly beautiful because we got to talk about our podcast. We got to then say, okay, now go to Red Light Rebellion for resources. This is how you can get involved in your community. And so that was awesome to have with that. But we really just wanted this season to focus on not only we're big on leading by example and doing what we're doing and being completely transparent in that, but also so people can say, how do I join the fight? What can I do? Because there's space for everybody. And if it's not anti-human trafficking, there's the unsheltered community. There's the domestic violence shelters. The so there's board. so many fight for your kids, like board. whatever. Yeah. So there's so many different outlets. And so with being in the anti-human trafficking movement, we've been blessed through ministry to especially Becky to sit in meetings and connect with different nonprofits. And even before we would go and it was just us two joining the fight in our community and we would go to safe houses and look at different nonprofits just to try to provide resources on our podcast. So when survivors came to us like, hey, where do I go? And we're like, oh, well, we don't know enough. Yeah. We don't know. And especially when it comes to vetting different nonprofits, we've learned so much. So that's another thing is what we want to focus on in this season is how to get involved, definitely have to take action and protecting the kids. It's not just, again, I know we talked about it this past weekend at church, but as far as like, what does the walk look like and walking in your faith and not just lip service? And having to take action to actually protect the children. Because again, when it comes to the children, there's no debate. It's not up for debate. It's not up for debate. No, no political figure, no government, nobody is coming to save you or your family. So we try to share the raw and reality of that. And again, in our community is one thing that we're going to focus on and also share different things that we're doing in our community with organizations where you can create your own opportunity to, if there's not a network in your community, you have the opportunity to start one and do your own outreach. Yeah. So going, going back to what you said about social media and how it, what we heard um, this weekend from, from Jaku, his biggest message was, it was definitely to the men. That was the biggest message. And it was, phenomenal to see a room half filled with men in a fight that's been predominantly women it was so cool to see all right men you're here to go but let's say there isn't a man that's cool but his whole po his whole point is was nobody in the world is coming to save you your goal is to make your family healthy happy spiritual all of the things that you need to do and so that, looking at that, like that's really where what we've done over the last six months, six, seven, eight months is how do we take our lives and make them better, make them that from the outside, you can see that we are following God and that is what we do. And like one of the things like Bridget said is for Lent, not that we celebrate Lent, but that time frame, um, we got off social media. And now I found like, at first I thought it was going to be hard. I didn't think it was hard at all. Like it was relieving to not have to see the nonsense going on all the time where I think it was hard is when like cool things happened and I wanted to share with friends I wasn't going to see or family that I didn't have a chance to talk to. And so that was hard to not be able to share the cool things that happened, <clears throat> excuse me, happened in like that five or six week time frame. Do you find yourself off social media more than you used to be? Cause like I will go on 
And I can scan for, I'll like scan five minutes, five, 10 minutes. And then I'm like, this shit's boring. And I'll put it away. Like it does not have the same holds that it used to for me. I would say even before I didn't really get stuck in the scrolling part, Mm -hmm. but what I would do would, I would become definitely way more intentional. Like if it was on the screen when I popped on, or I would go to specific people that we do outreach with or friends with, because it was like at one time censoring timelines. Mm -hmm. So I was searching them, them and like getting caught up on their content and still trying to do advocacy, but really like with social media, when I went into that whole unplug um, and spiritual detox from everything, everyone, friends, family, literally people will be like, Bridget, you're crazy. Um, and the so with that, thing, that's a little hard for me, but <laughs> I think it's awesome. But that whole not eating thing, like I feel like with that, that was so God driven because at first I shocked myself with the not eating for 40. Well, eventually it was 43 days, but I did that to myself on added days. But with that whole not eating thing was at first I was just going to do, um, smoothies. And then I went that one morning to go get smoothies. And of course, at this time frame, I had been dealing with a lot of mental health stuff going on with work and everything happening in that position. And so I literally had a full mental breakdown. And so I went to go get my smoothie that one morning. And I was just like, I, I did not care about literally if I was late to work. I was like, oh, I'll just call out. And so I got into that time frame of where I was literally having to force myself out of bed. And so I went to go get a smoothie after taking my daughter to school. And behind the smoothie place is like this. Uh, if you live in downtown Gilbert, you it's literally like the little canal area. And so I walk over there and it was like raining and I see uh, a rainbow. And so I just sat there drinking my smoothie and I was just sitting there praying and I wasn't even really on my phone. Granted, I did take a picture so I could like reference it back, like just stop and be present kind of moment. But I found myself doing more like vlogging in my phone because at that time I didn't have the energy or strength to really journal, which is my out, like my outlet and go-to. So I didn't really have the strength to do that. And so I was doing more of the videos in my phone and so much content in my phone that never made it to social media. It was just more so like, hey, if you have to reference back this one day. Um, But for me, it was more intentional. But also with the whole unplugging from the time periods we were, I also found myself leaving my phone. Like if you know me and you talk to me all the time, I'm really good at responding right away. I now leave my phone on leave me alone mode. I've created literally a leave me alone mode. And so during that whole time frame, my phone would stay on leave me alone mode. All the notifications from all social media is not on my phone. Uh, so it changed my habits. And like, Same. even though I was didn't make an addiction out of it, it just changed. Like I'm more intentional now. So again, I have my phone on leave me alone mode. So now you'll find me respond some days. It might be, unless I talk to you like Becky, you might get like a a quicker response within an hour, but some people it's now like three days a week or I'm like, oh my gosh, I completely spaced out. Like I'll respond in my head, but then forget to hit set. So I think that's the only difference with social media and like my phone specifically is I don't use my phone as much, especially with me not being an assistant for a CEO anymore it's been so nice not having to use my phone. In fact, I locked myself out of other social media devices or other technology devices. And so like I had to go to Apple and like I have every layer of security, but then I forgot my password. Oh no. And so I didn't update them in my phone. I was journaling them at that point and I lost the journal. So I'm like, ah, oh, no. So I had to like do proof of purchase and all that. So I was like, I don't even need it. <laughs> So yeah, I have all never, these devices I can't get into. <laughs> never mind. It's not worth it. Well, and I know I did the same thing in some of them. Like I took all the social media apps and I moved them all the way off where you have to like scroll for them in the library. Yeah. And then I turned yeah. off notifications because I don't, 
care what people say about anything that I post or say. And that was the biggest thing is like, I'm not looking for likes. I'm not looking for shares or follows or any of that stuff. If I post something, God will send the one person that needs to hear whatever that thing is or see whatever that thing is. That's it. If one person sees it, high five. They get to go do with it what they need to do with it. And I don't even need to know. And yeah. so that was for me probably the biggest like, oh my gosh, if I if I reply to something, blah, 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 whatever. Like I posted that that Tim Ballard meme where he said something about whatever. Like you thought that the end of the world was coming. But for me, it was like, all these people would come and say, well, you shouldn't do this and you're not protecting survivors and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't even have to sit here and listen to you. Like that was probably the most freeing thing ever. Like, I don't know you. I don't care what you say about what I do. The people I know and the people I love have the same thoughts and and similar. That's why we're friends. I care what they say. The rest of you, if I don't know who you are, I don't care that you comment on my post. Go away. Like, whatever. Yeah. And I think too, even with that conversation, just on like posts in general, we saw a lot with Sound of Freedom is the frustration of knowing we've talked to so many people over the past couple of years and we said, hey, do you want to come on our podcast and have this conversation? If it's not about human trafficking, let's just talk about faith, family, freedom, your testimony and leading people to the Lord and, and you know, your spiritual growth. And so it's been pretty interesting to see that, but then also everyone wants to throw back, oh, you're not protecting the children or st really standing with the children or survivors. And it's like, if you actually listen to the survivors and listen to their testimonies and listen to the podcast, you would see you're actually protecting people who continue to perpetuate yep. the abuse and things that we definitely are speaking out against. And so again, with all of that too, is so many people get uh, caught up in the chaos of all of it yep. and they don't step back for a moment and reflect of, I know during this period of, I'm going to say spiritual timeout of going <laughs> through everything. For it. Yeah. Everything I was going through, like people will be like, well, what have you been up to? And I'm like, well, let me tell you, I was sitting in women's group ministry. We are sitting at vacation Bible school. I even, I actually got the time to go and sit with a huge group of not only, it was actually really interesting to see. Um, it was the, the faith city and then Arizona trauma informed faith coalition. And then there was somebody else. Um, Maricopa. Maricopa, Maricopa County of Public Health. So seeing people in this one room talk about trauma and talk about healing and bridging together the communities and knowing what we took a step back from, I'm like, okay, God, <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> so we're sitting in there and seeing ever, what was the most eye-opening thing is seeing on this stage of all these pastors and different world leaders and law enforcement and people from all backgrounds and all religions on, especially on the stage for all religions and the pastors, um, you had every religion on one stage. And it was actually really funny because they called it out with the Christian was like, how do you feel sitting next to all these people of all these religions with so many different beliefs and so many things to say, but if you really sat and they had to sit and listen to everybody because the whole room is looking at them. Mm -hmm. And so it's an, it was an eight hour class and just on trauma. And so we're sitting there. It was interesting to see them all talk about the different religions, but at the end of the day, it all came back down to love and the beliefs and literally just community and how to bridge that gap, and how to create the safe space. But then also what blew my mind was seeing people who have started down here, and now up here, 
forgot about the people down here, like the unsheltered community. So now you have the unsheltered community and you have outreach and whether it's drug and alcohol abuse or sexual abuse, you have now those people speaking and the pastors and all the leaders are in the room. And so during the breakout sessions, hearing them then go back up and say, wow, I didn't realize how i should have got involved in my own church or I may have judged some of these people like the unsheltered community, like, oh, they're dirty, but you don't know their life story. You don't know what they've gone through. So even just like the stereotypes and hearing it from so many different perspectives and everyone sitting back and looking like, wow, I actually am in a position to change or be a voice for them because I'm up here, but I'm no, I'm actually no different and I can relate to them too, and doing the humane thing of being a voice for them. So that was very impactful of seeing like all the different people in one room of every ethnicity, every religion. And there was absolutely nothing but love in there and everyone getting informed on uh, how we make our communities better through trauma therapy but also trauma-informed care therapy, but also um, just listening and talking to one another and being a safe space for one another. That's super cool because I haven't heard that story and I didn't know all of that. I knew you went, but I, we hadn't had a chance to talk about like what all went down um, with all of that. Uh, but as you were talking, this really like cool, this is not related, but related, like this really cool thought came to my mind about where we started and this is with our friend Emma where we started standby survivors mm -hmm. and the whole idea of standby survivors was that we would take all of the people and we would just continually grow the circle larger mm -hmm. because everyone was fighting everyone was disagreeing all this stuff and it's like no we're all going to come together to join as one and I pulled um, up a Bible verse while you were talking because I knew it was in there. I just didn't know what it was. And so it's Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12. And it says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And so I thought about it as you were speaking where like we are still together and we're still doing the things and, and Emma, she doesn't live by us, but she's still in there doing her own thing. And we're all back to back because we're all doing our own thing out the other way. But in all of those things, bringing everybody in kind of into our circle and not even necessarily that we go around saying we're standby survivors or we're this. And that's cool that we are, but like you, you've turned this way and are, are doing the outreach and doing the stuff that way. And Emma is still rocking it on her podcast and is like absolutely crushing it. And I, I messaged, we mess, I messaged her in our chat where it was like, this was supposed to be three years ago. It was supposed to be just five survivors. And she's on three years and 250,000 followers. Like that's wild. That's huge. And I'm, I don't care if I have three followers, but I think it's awesome that she has all these things and continually has someone to talk to about the dark ickiness. So again, if you, if you want to learn more about this and are ready to like jump in the deep end with, with everything, go listen to the imagination because it is absolutely stunning. And then I'm over here at church meeting these other ministries and meeting these other groups and we don't do anything as a church. We just connect people out to all these other areas. And as we, as you were talking, like that vision came in my head where it was like, no, this is exactly what we intended to be without yeah. knowing that this was exactly what we intended. We intend when we did it, it was like, okay, we're going to huddle and we're going to face in and it's just going to be us against the world. And God's like, uh-uh, <laughs> turn around because it still is you against the world. You're just saving each other back to back and you all get to do your piece together yeah so that was really like that's cool to tie that thought together because that is literally what this whole event was but in between we had to do like trauma informed exercises mm -hmm. so hold on I have to go get it from the room next door because it's gonna tie it all <laughs> 
she's like, I have to go. I have to find this. You know that it was it was coming. And I was looking at my phone when she uh, when she was telling her story. But it 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 really has been an amazing journey over the last six months that like we never even know. Oh, good. We have toys. So, <laughs> so we had this in our bag. So in between the sessions, we literally had to do breath work. So we did prayer, but then literally it was like, everybody's out here. So it was inhale, exhale, and then you bring it back together. That's so everyone goes out and then comes back together. Oh, how so cool is that? Well, and then you go yeah. again, breath work. That's what they say. The voice of God. That's what his name is, is inhale, yeah. exhale. And so it's in yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. that's so that's it. exactly what brought it all together at the event. And so every single person had to do this together. And then we first did prayer and then we did breath work together. That's so. that's super cool. Well, and it's it's interesting. I want to talk about I want to talk about the like the Christian part of it for a second too. Like I grew up Catholic. You grew up Catholic, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um and so I'm not big into the religion part. Like I we we go to church like we go to a church that is very here's the Bible, here's what the Bible says. This is how you put it together and you can um, and it's really pretty throat crunchy. That's what our pastor calls it is like, he's going to be mean because the world doesn't agree with what the Bible says. And so this is how it's going to be. But I kind of want to point out this. I want to point out this thought that many people feel like being a Christian is one day you're not. And the next day you are, and everything gets fixed. And from here on out, you're golden. And it, it like I had a time where I believe God stepped in and said, all right, we're done. We're figuring this out. Here's what you need. He healed me of like anxiety and depression and things like that. But it hasn't been easy. Like the last four years aren't like, oh, this is great and awesome, wonderful. But it's consistency. Like you talked about journaling and praying. I do the Bible app. It's you version Bible app. I am on day 1063 consecutive times reading some devotional or Bible piece mm -hmm. because that's what you need. It's not that every day it's, oh my God. And yes, don't get me wrong. God is great. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But every day I do not wake up and I'm like, hallelujah. I do have to do that. Like, but that's taken three years of when my first response is Jesus help me. That's taken three years. And I grew up in the, in the church. Like I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic uh, high school. I did all of those things. And not until the last three years of really being in the Bible and in church and in community, have I be, been able to, when I am having something bad's happening, know that if I pray or if I say something and I've seen the results, like if you've ever... I'm sure it's happened to you, but if you wake up in the middle of the night because you had a bad dream or something icky is happening, first thing I start saying is I'm like, Jesus Christ, help me. Jesus Christ, help me. And it calms you down because that shit's evil. Like, yeah. and when you get into this kind of fight with human trafficking, if all of a sudden you're thinking, um, oh, my car's broken down again, or I need more money. I can't go here. I can't do that. And you're not ascribing that to Satan. You're missing the mark because he, the evil that happens on this earth is absolutely here to stop you from doing God's work. And so you've got to know how to fight it and you've got to know how to ward that off. Absolutely. And actually I want to touch on that because growing up Catholic as well. And one of the main reasons of why I left the Catholic church was because the originally the, pa uh, the pastor who baptized me, it wasn't me directly, but the pastor who baptized me, uh, he was also in charge of the teen youth group. And so I left the church because our parents pulled us out as we didn't feel comfortable anymore, as there was multiple pastors who were high up there with the main top people of Phoenix, uh, all of that coalition. And they were tied to uh, sexual abuse to boys 
and to the youth. And mind you, they were the teen leaders. So that is one reason why I left the Catholic church. But then also I never, I would say looking the difference for me personally and now building my own relationship. Like I've always had my relationship with God, but really understanding that relationship, I would say now with the Christian, with Christianity versus Catholic, like now knowing what we know and like, I always saw Catholics and like the rituals Mm -hmm. and I never understood Mm -hmm. it. And so now knowing what we know, especially being on a spiritual journey over the past four years, especially um, the last three in podcasting, I would, in working directly with survivors and doing all the advocacy, there's no way, absolutely no way that we could do the advocacy to the level and extent that we do if we didn't have our faith. Amen. And if we literally weren't reading our Bibles and getting in scripture, and if we aren't in scripture, it's the music that we surround ourselves with. But also like, even when, which I'll talk about later, we, even when I'm on the hotline with Rescue America, I have my coloring, my scripture coloring book, but then you also will see different things pop up on my phone from the daily devotion. And then if it's not in there, I have like a specific one for like motherhood or praying over family. And so even like mental health, as I was struggling with that during a huge time frame over the last nine months in my work. And so even just healing from all of the narcissistic abuse and all of that aspect, um, that has made me open my eyes so much deeper And there's days where I'm like, I'm at this certain part of the Bible, because I've learned like when I had to go to the uh, spiritual gifts, well, I didn't have to go. I got, it was like (laughs) in my path. Forster, God Forster. (laughs) When I I got sent to literally spiritual school, I was sitting in (laughs) spiritual gifts class, like, why am I here? God, show me like, what am I doing here? And I was shown, but even just sitting in that and it was like, oh, this is why you respond to these situations and why you go to here for outreach. So understanding and how to use those gifts to help other people has been super intriguing. But also with that is there's some days where I'm like, okay, I'm here in the Bible, but if my Bible's closed, then and I'm having a bad day or like in that moment, I'll literally go to my Bible and I'll just open it and whatever it opens to, I'm like, okay, it relates. That's That's, and, And there's your answer. So that's one thing is not only from the music, but also just learning and everyone's journey is different. And so, but it takes time. It does take time. It does not happen overnight. Like trust me like we've all gone through our own things and to get where I am today versus way back then definitely has taken a lot of years um and some a lot of lessons where you will continue to get that same lesson until you fully are ready to go on and have the strength for the the next season so I would say also being mindful of other people on their spiritual journeys because everyone's looks different. And one thing I definitely want to focus on is trauma. And especially as Christians and those who have experienced any sort of abuse from the church, and especially if they were raped by a pastor, Um, or someone in the church that they went to for healing and all of that aspect. Um, And when I mean healing, I mean, as in if they were going to counseling through the Christian community, whether it was marriage or porn or whatever addiction they were going through. So with that is be mindful and sit with people in their season. Because another thing I learned in the trauma class that I went to is with our thoughts, but then our words Mm -hmm. and how there's life and death in the power of the tongue. So with that, it was also interesting to see all of these leaders up there and realizing, wow, 
if I talk to an addict like an addict, they're always going to be an addict. But if I empower them and change the wording and how I talk to them, it's going to empower them because if someone's always telling them that they're messed up or they're sick or just think what that does to the mental health and to the mindset. So if we refrain our words and how we talk to people, that can actually be more powerful and impactful to empower someone who's facing adversity and addiction to get out of the situation that they're in. And then they feel more comfortable opening up to you because you're meeting them with empathy, compassion, grace. And so we have to learn no different than anything we've all sinned and nobody's perfect. And whatever we've gone through, literally have given it to God and known, okay, I've repented and that's between me and you and that relationship but then also not staying stuck in it, but allow yourself to feel those emotions Mm -hmm. and not suppress them. Because when you suppress them or you numb them with alcohol, drugs, sex, porn, whatever that may be, you're going to come back. No different than I referred to it on our New Year's podcast. No different than someone who's struggling from a drug addiction, you have that 30, 60, 90 day gap. Everyone has an addiction to something. And so just looking back at our own lives and our own going inner and saying, how can I change myself and be mindful of how I treat other people? Yeah. And even, and even talking about people that don't have necessarily have addiction or trauma, like just even family and friends who like you can't force them to go to church you can't force Mm -hmm. them to eat better you can't force them because the thing that I've learned over this this amount of time which is really hard for me because I want to help everybody and all of the stuff that I've learned and you just can't because it's not their time to learn it Mm -hmm. and the biggest thing I think we I mentioned this on a podcast a long time ago is God doesn't need your help because if God's going to wake someone up to figure something out, God will wake somebody up and figure something out. What God does need is when, when he taps that person on the shoulder and says, I need you to wake up. They need someone to go to. They need to remember that you maybe said something about that or remember that you were a really nice person and they want to go find out what you're doing and why you're doing it or whatever. And so our job is to plant the seeds. God's job is to make it grow. And he doesn't need our help to do any of that, but he's allowing us to, to be available, be the hands and feet. And so again, like that is going to, that whole concept works really well into what we're doing in, in our church. And I want to talk about voice of hope because I want to talk about rescue America and what you're doing doesn't have to be in detail. We can have another one where it goes longer and you can talk about survivors. But my co-lead at church, Lisa, she um, knew the founder, um, Allison Madrigal. She knew her from when it, when they lived in Houston. Allison started an organization called Rescue Houston. Um, and that eventually became Rescue America. And it is a faith-based organization that helps um, women, a majority women, get out of the life of prostitution. Because as we know, prostitution usually is not a choice, although maybe 0.032%, I'm totally making up a number, they choose to do this. The majority do not choose to do this life. They are missing a need that is being met through this. They are being forced, frauded, or coerced into doing it some other way. They have a pimp. They have family that is making them do this. So What Voice of Hope started at our church about, it was May of last year, so May of 2022, and they started with just a couple people, and the concept of of Rescue America and their Voice of Hope is our church's specific um, outreach, and so the point of it is that in, in pairs, just like Jesus sent the disciples out in twos, we call um, sex ads. 
And now we don't know the numbers. We don't know who we're calling. Um, it's all within their database so that the volunteers are not liable for anything. They are not tracked, That none of that. It's all very safe and very um, protected. But what we do is we actually call these numbers and the majority of the time we leave voicemails and it says, if you are in this situation and you would like to get out of the life, you can call this number or go to this website. Um, we have help for you. We're praying for you. God bless. Generally speaking, that's kind of what it is. Every once in a while, we will get somebody to pick up the phone. Most of the time they hang up on you <laughs> or they say, I never left. I, I don't have a sex ed. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, fine. Every once in a while, and I would say out of like 200 calls that we do once a month, maybe five of those are so are like decent calls where somebody will stop and listen and we pray for them and we talk to them. Now, does that mean they're calling the hotline the next day? Maybe not. Probably not. Actually, it's not until they, they need something or they get to a point in their life or God's ready for them to move on, do they ever call? But our job is to plant the seed, give them the number, give them the, the website and let them know that there are people out there that are actually thinking about them, that we want to pray for you, that we want you to have a better life than what you currently have. And the cool thing is we started that and, and Bridget came on and she was doing some of these and she was like, okay, but how do I do more? And I had heard that they had something called what was a hotline advocate. It's still a volunteer position and all the things. And I was like, well, shit, Bridget likes to talk to people like she would be perfect for this sort of role. And so she went on and was able to do that. But can you explain kind of what you do and how you got started? Yeah. So originally, like Becky said, I started with Voice of Hope. I still do Voice of Hope. We're going yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> We're going tomorrow. So if you're free from six to eight at Rock Point Church, shameless plug, and <laughs> go mm -hmm. there and meet us at the Human Trafficking Outreach. First Thursday of every month, if you're listening later date. Yeah, absolutely. And just show up or email us and, or message us and we'll give you the, the email to contact. Anyways, uh, going off of that is when I first did it. I was nervous. I was like, wait, what do you mean? I'm calling live like to sex ads. And so I sat there, of course, cause you go through a little training when you're new. And so I sat there and I listened to the group ones. I did my first call and then I think I left a voicemail or something. And then I finally got to talk to someone. And so then I was like, oh man, it's over already. Like, can we do more or how do I do more? So that's when I asked Becky. So they got me connected. And so being a hotline advocate, so this would be step two. So voice of hope is step one. Step two is now they're calling the hotline back and they're ready to exit the life. So rescue America again. I will, I know this little thing by now by heart. So <laughs> rescue America, they exist to rescue, revive and empower the sexually exploited. So what happens is now when they call the hotline, they get me on there or another hotline advocate and we're doing an intake. So what that means, we're seeing if on the hotline number, if someone, whether it's, we have to identify if it's sexually exploitation, if they're unsheltered community and they need a resource to a shelter or uh, if it's trauma from drugs and alcohol, if they need a resource for that suicide hotline, if they're dealing with suicidal thoughts, we connect them with the suicide hotline. So again, we'll complete an intake form. And then for me so far, I've gotten mostly only sexually exploited and in the front lines of human trafficking. So we also talk to whether it's a safe house and they're looking to help placement for a survivor who's ready to exit the life and they are now, or if they're in the hospital, behavioral health, um, if they are getting out of jail because whatever situation, domestic violence or whatever that situation may be, and now they're trying to get help but also if they are in, or if they are in a hotel and currently being trafficked, 
from whether it's the cartel or if it is their handler that they're living with, whatever that situation looks like. So now we're taking the intake form of their name, their date of birth, the location, and all of that information with their story. So then from all the information that I gather, and I, of course, we also end with prayer and doing ministry over them and praying for safety, of course. Um, but then from there, I then submit it to, I submit the form and it goes to a Rescue America exit strategist, which is step three. And so now the exit strategist then reviews the intake notes and then it turns to a case work, a case worker is assigned. And then from there, they make a plan for long-term placement and healing for the survivor. So from there, they will then, whether it's arranged travel or a safe house, whatever that situation on the next step of their healing journey, that's what Rescue America stands in to really be that gap. So that has been such a eye-opening experience, especially because we've been blessed by, again, the grace of God to work with survivors these past years that it's given me the knowledge and the capacity spiritually and mentally and physically to be on the hotline to help other victims and survivors going through this as they're trying to, again, change their life and exit the life. And so it's been actually very intriguing hearing so many different stories, but I think the most sad part is that there's so many people, especially even with Voice of Hope, as long as you tell a survivor, which we always say is you matter, you are enough, the energy shifts immediately. And so just letting them know that you see them and you hear them it changes the whole tone of the conversation. So I get a lot of life stories. And so with that is there's not too much, there's not too many resources around satanic ritual abuse right now. So the hotline has been, the hotline has been super busy with SRA and there's not too many people who will listen because again, they're not trained. They don't know what to look for. And they just think that the victims and survivors are crazy. So what's happening is they end up in a psych ward mm -hmm. or attempt to put them in a psych ward. And so then when they get someone like me on the line and they're like, wait, what, you know about this? And so it's been, that is one thing where I'm glad, especially the last call a couple of nights ago, before the summit, I had um, a caller and she was on the verge of suicide. And Suicide Hotline gave her our number and then she got me on the phone and I ended up talking to her for like three hours. And we had a conversation just about trauma, her life story. And she didn't realize she was an SRA survivor because it's been so normalized in her family and her upbringing. And she was sexual, there was sexual assault throughout her childhood and throughout her life. So again, it was normal to her and the cultism. So that part, once those little things started to click and validation, she's like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. So then you start to see just even us having those conversations of planting the seed. Now, did she call the hotline tomorrow and be like, I need to be, I want to be rescued as far as I'm saved, I'm ready to exit the life. She did the first step. And so with that, Rescue America also does 30, 60, 90 day follow-ups with those who have exited the life. So just little seed, just planting little seeds like that makes a huge difference too. Yeah. Cause you never know, you never know who we called six months ago, who's now sitting in the bathroom of a hotel room. Like I'm done. I'm done. Either I call this number that I saved in my phone or I end my life. And so we don't know. Again, it's not for us to know, but we are actually one of the more successful hubs out there um, because we, for whatever reason, well, God, but for whatever reason, we end up with with a bunch of calls and we have a decent callback score and, and really decent. It's like two, three, four, five percent. So it's not exactly like 50 percent of the people are calling us back, but um, 
the cool thing is it can be tracked to who who sent out the call if if that's the case and so it's just a really um it's a different sort of advocacy that I never even knew existed, which it, we're blessed to have that you don't necessarily need to be going out on the streets, although we do want to do that too and bring bring bags to people who need to be out there. But this is a way that you can just start up your own uh, your own little session. I think you all you need is four people to start the first one is just enough to do two, two pairs to go out and do it. And so again, for those who are listening and like, Hey, I'm really interested in connecting with rescue America to get this done. Send us a message. Either one of us can get you in contact with, with um, the person at our church that does it or rescue America directly. And, and you can get that started. And that's kind of where we wanted this podcast to go. And I mean, we could go on for five hours with the amount of information we have from people we've met and to be able to be that bridge to connect people and, and talk to different things. But I feel like what we can, as things happen, we can start bringing them to our podcast. And so you're not really going to see us weekly. You're going to see us maybe monthly you're going to see us maybe every other month it's going to be kind of when it fits and and the things that are happening that we feel are are valid to share and things that you can do to to help take a stand in in your area um we we burned ourselves out and it was absolutely necessary because we need those 90 episodes to be sitting out there to inform all of the people who are just now figuring this out and figuring out that this is a big deal and going, holy crap, how do I keep my kids safe? Um, we're blessed that God directed us to do this so that we can share with parents how to how to do better with their kids. But we're also blessed now to be able to say, okay, how do you help your community? Because like we were talking about at the beginning, if you don't save your family, if you don't, if you're still watching porn, if you're still watching and paying attention more to sports than going to church on Sunday or spending time with God or spending time with your kids, you're perpetuating the issues of society. You're not making this any better. And no politician either side is going to fix it. The hearts of America, the hearts of the world are broken. And until we figure out how to do that, and fix that within our own small sections, within our family, and then within our neighborhoods, within our community, we're never going to be a better world. And so it's not it's not always we have to give money to everything. We have to go do whatever. If, if you do one thing this month, this year, and that's to be a better person and a better parent and a better sibling, child, whatever, start there. That's hard enough to fix yourself. Mm -hmm. Even just having the uncomfortable conversations, we have to learn to break those stigmas. But even just going back really quick, I do want to reference if anyone is listening, who is in need of a number for whether it's suicide or human trafficking hotline, if you've ever had to perform sexual acts for food, clothes, shelter, money or drugs, please, please, please call this organization, again, they're waiting to help you start a new life. You can call 24-7. The number is 833-599-3733. And you can text or call that number. So again, 833-599-FREE. And so just know that, again, there are people there to help you. And if you want to learn more, visit exitthelife.com. And again, with that, like Becky said, both of us personally do outreach with this organization. And one thing too, as far as like the front lines and what really drew me to getting more involved was Becky and I never stayed out of the community over the past years. We were always in community, but with that, we were also balancing a podcast and then our family, and then our work schedules. So with that, our lifestyle has changed and flipped upside down completely. Mm -hmm. And walking away from corporate America 
And best thing we from, ever did. Yeah. For me, it wasn't really you're working with corporate America people, but it was still family based, but it didn't, it was still corporate. But the America. rules of corporate America applied because you were working with Absolutely. corporate America. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so just now God has brought us back in this season to community and family and balancing and really staying glued to the spiritual side has always been the front line, but now in like literally community. And that has been our focus too, especially like with survivors and the youth, but even parents and just building that up. Because again, it starts at home. It starts with these conversations. It's happening everywhere. It's happening in our families. It's happening in our backyards. So together, like we have to be aware of what is going on. Amen. But yeah, that's with Rescue America. That, um, yeah. Anything else you want to bring up before we we close out? And uh, yeah, the Lighthouse Summit. Well, that's a long thing to talk. About. <laughs> uh, we could do clips though, because that that piece is like that piece is huge. Because when we went to that two years ago, it's the two year twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, two years ago. I remember when Yako got off stage and I said, one day we're going to be up here with you or we're going to be on an event with you. And then Becky was co-lead of putting that together. And then we were there volunteering. And then I was with Rescue America's table and then doing some volunteering with the church too. But together, we all came together and it was just so cool. So like, I'm going to say it again is like Becky and I, out of all the advocacy and human anti-human trafficking events we've gone to when it comes to tying the reality of human trafficking and how quick it happens and so many people saw sound of freedom and then they think oh you know they come to my door or they kidnap me or then they take me to an island um to see that reality brought back to you know this mm-hmm. little device right here this is where it's happening yep and So then to see like people that we've worked with, like even with Rescue America, when I was going through the training uh, before I became a hotline advocate, there was some videos with On Watch and Chris. Fantastic. Yeah. With Chris McKenna from Protect Young Eyes or. Yeah. yeah, Protect Young Eyes. Mm -hmm. Protect Young Eyes. And when we were sitting there doing those videos, I'm like, hey, we podcasted with him. Hey, we worked with them. Mm -hmm. And then to see like the Lighthouse Summit. And I was honestly so proud of you and Lisa and everyone who put that event together. But then also Red Light Rebellion. Like the work. So good. They did so amazing. And the work that they've done on the front lines in our own community. Like I was so proud to see them standing up there to say, that's the only people I trust with the youth when it comes to like outreach and awareness. And so to tie all of the conversations together and have them there to really bridge the gap for everyone who's just learning, like that was a, a lot to take in on a first event. But when you look back and you see even Bark's videos and Mm -hmm. everything, we're like, I wish people would be able to see all of this because people always pick our brains like well I want to know what you know so to see that all in one session for a conference honestly I was like yes thank you God this is something we prayed for and men we prayed for more men to join the fight and then to have Yako go up there and be like how I'm like yes (laughs) I know it was we so again like I mentioned earlier we had the January walk um, earlier this year. And then right after we had to start planning this, it's like, right, who is going to be our speakers? Who's going to be this person? Who's going to do this thing? And so like she said, Lisa and I have been planning this for five, six months. And two weeks ago, we were sitting somewhere around, I don't know, the 250, 200 person mark of people who paid to come to this event. Um, that also then included about 50 volunteers, 12 leaders. Uh, I think we had we ended up with 24 different partners at tables. Um, and so we're like, all right, well, that's a pretty good amount. Like three, 350 is is a pretty good amount of people that 
um, have come because two years ago, I think they said the amount of people who paid was somewhere in the 150 to 200 range. And then with all the volunteers and, and vendors were, um, their partners was about 300, somewhere in the 300 range. And so we're like, all right, well, we're at where we were two years ago. And then we had two more weeks. Well, if you've ever planned anything in the church, everybody registers within like 48 hours of what, when the event is. So you can never actually plan. Um, but one of the things that I would repeatedly tell the the team was we could potentially blow this thing out of the water. We're planning to have enough food for 500 people. That includes all the volunteers, all the partners, all of the things. And so by the, the week before, we're probably like at the, at the Friday, it would have been actually Saturday afternoon. Yeah. We were at 325 paid attendees. We're like, heck yeah, 325, like just the paid attendees is higher than the last one. Then we have a hundred extra people that we have to feed. We're still within the 500 and we can do another 75 people coming in. Like we're good. We're so golden. And then Yaku Boyens comes and he speaks at our men's ministry. We had what normally has 12 to 15 or 12 to 20 men um, on a Saturday morning had over 150 men there. Um, he was invited oh. to, it was so cool. He was invited to speak to, um, speak at each of our five services. He had maybe five minutes, but if you've ever heard him speak, he doesn't even need that long to knock your shoes off. So he ended up speaking at all the services and I get emails when people um, register. And so I knew exactly when he went on stage because all of a sudden all of the emails started popping in that they were coming to the lighthouse summit. And I'm like, people pay attention, you're in church, but that's what they started doing. And so we went, we went from 325 to having to order 50 more box lunches because we are really kissing the 500 mark to day of, I called Bridget and I were talking. I was like, oh my gosh, you'll never guess how many people we have. And she's like 800. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I was going to say 550, but now that you made it not seem so cool, never mind. <laughs> but it literally ended up, we ended up day of with 710 paid attendees. I don't know that all of them showed up, but we had 710 paid attendees all of the people I mentioned before, and we were well over 800 people in the auditorium. Now, again, our, our worship center holds 1400. So it wasn't packed, but it was full. And it was so amazing to see what God can do through people. Like God sent that God sent that video or that movie, Sound of Freedom. He put it out there. I wouldn't say just for our event. I'm never going to be that kind of a person. But it the timing of it worked so well that we were able to put this event on that we knew about a year ago. And it works that people who normally wouldn't attend are like, oh, my God, how do I get involved? And then we have things like, Red Light Rebellion, who we have episodes with, go back and listen to those because to those ones because they're fantastic. Where okay, I'm on the PTO and I can get them into my school. Cool, that's your call to action. Then we have um, the local uh, town council and mayor and police department come in, and now it's oh cool, our own people are are fighting this too. Okay, now I know that that I'm in the right space. Then we get Allison up there talking and she's talking about Rescue America and the voice of hope and doing all of those things and starting your own outreach and, and all these things. And now the people who are comfortable on the phone, they're like, all right, I can help. I can do that. Then we have, um, like Bridget was saying, there's something for everybody. And we have a panel up there that now is an, is the town of of Gilbert's police department and the the founder of another organization that works with, with youth and a survivor. And so there's there's all of these things that maybe that's not your your space, but this one might be, or that one might be. And then of course we end it with Yaku, who's up there for 40 minutes and literally 
like dismantled Anthony Fauci, which was like the best part of the entire <laughs> the entire night and how all of COVID was a fraud and all, all like, look at what they've done to us and look at how we did. And you know, those people in the audience were like, wait, what? And the politicians. And that, that no politician is coming to save you. He's like, I'm, I was on Trump's team. I know him. I know these people over here. I don't think Carrie Lake's going to save you. I don't think this person... It doesn't matter. It just goes back and forth and each side pretends that they're moving the needle when they're just making it worse. And so it was it was one of those events that even the people who put it on and knew everything that was happening was like, holy shit. <laughs> like we've seen Yako speak before and we were like, okay, he turns it a, no a notch up every single time. But this time we were like, everything in one advocacy anti-human trafficking so event cool. you want it was like that was the real gut punch and I think yep. that's what I love is so many people try to as it's trending which it's not trend human trafficking is not should a never trend. be a trendy thing anyway it never be yeah it should never be a trend at all all people should have to know is that there's abuse children are being hurt sacrificed and that's all you should need to hear to step up and step in you yep. shouldn't need a rape video you shouldn't need proof you shouldn't that's that's beyond me if you need to see a rape video to step in and do something um yeah. I digress that conversation but anyways <laughs> going back to that going back and just knowing like we knew everyone up there and we we're like okay this is gonna be a really powerful impactful event but then to see it all and then to step back we're like and even just the worship team and hearing them sing, like there's no way you left that building without understanding the reality of trauma prevention, how to get involved and the reality of human trafficking and how it's literally happening while you're in the house and your kids in their room or in the other yep. room or standing right next to you yep. in the car, like yep. There were so many videos of even just showing the moms right here, the kids right here. And these are the conversations going on in the phone. Yep. You think they're playing a game or you think they're texting. This is what's happening from news to all of that. So I think that was so impactful. And so many people now are going to go home. And yeah, it did trigger a lot of people and probably their own trauma. But at least people are going to talk about it now. And so many people will say, oh, but you didn't sell out the the church or whatever. It's not about that. It never was about that. For the anti-human trafficking movement, like for when it started, like in the very beginning, when we did Voice of Hope, I think there was maybe like, I don't know, three or as maybe like four or five people, people. Mm -hmm. four or five people. And then now to see like prior to even doing this event, more people, it's up to like 17. Yeah, now 17 you know, last month. Mm hmm. Yeah, who knows what tomorrow is going to look like. Again, that's all God-driven. But even to get 800 people in one room who want to learn about human trafficking and protecting the children, that is huge. Even if they their takeaway is going to fix myself, great. That right. is a start. Right. And so that's one thing is so many people focus on numbers and likes and clout. And for us, it's always been the power of one. Yes. And just helping that one person, loving your neighbor, your family member, unless there's abuse attached to that. Yeah. Do not stay in that toxicity. But again, it goes back to having real and raw conversations. And there was no scripts, especially when it came to the panel, um, seeing a survivor go up there and share her raw emotions while sitting right next to human trafficking detectives and saying, this is where I was in the city and nobody. And helped. you didn't save me. It was not this lady, but the, yeah. Not her, not her per se, but just in general, the law enforcement, just so the people in the crowd, and it was just raw emotions of her sharing her story. And like, well, she even said, like, I thought the police would help me. Like somebody, I was there and nobody, everyone turned a blind eye. Yeah, even so, the rape detective said you you deserved yeah. what you got. And yeah. so this was 20 so here, years ago. It's a very different landscape now, but 
So hearing her for people sitting in the crowd to hear that of the what the rape detective said to her and then people will say well why didn't you just exit the life why are you barely speaking out so put that in perspective from a survivor's point of view to say this is what we have to go through this is our journey and to sit there and say it with detectives on the panel that was very impactful too because then people are now sitting there like oh my gosh I could have potentially said that or you know I could have done that to somebody or invalidated them or silenced them because of what I said so just looking at that perspective was very impactful too yeah the whole the whole thing was it again you do you do with what the gifts God gave you and so you put it out there you see what's going to happen and then you let God be God and you you see where where it's going to go and my whole prayer for the whole time was just send the person who needs to hear it. I don't, I don't care who it is. I don't care if that's my mom. I don't care if that was your mom. I don't care if it was an old lady, a young kid, whatever. But we had the gamut of demographics. Like my, my boys are there. Cause of course my boys know all of it. So they were there, but even one of my older son's friends, instead of going to high school ministry, He's like, yeah, I'll come over and I'll watch it with you. And so now they're able to take it to their school and their band and to talk about these things and be aware of these things. And and this boy's mom even said like, hey, you should do the, they have a community service thing they have to do by the time they're senior. And they're like, you should go and take this to the school and do something on human trafficking. And that's actually something you can't do your project on. And I'm like, we're going to have to talk about that. I'm going to have to figure out how the English department gets that fixed. Because even if it's a digital safety or it's it's something that would be beneficial to the community at that high school, something needs to happen. Absolutely. And I think even with the youth, that honestly will always make me cry and always be the most impactful, especially being moms and knowing yep. that our kids are in the age group of a targeted age group, but then also the little girl who walked up to me, like, I still remember her face when the little girl walked up to me at the Rescue America table and the mom started to speak for her as far as like how to get involved. And then she said, you know what, let me let her tell you. So then the little 13 year old girl, I didn't even hear this story. So I'm like amazed. Oh, by you're going to say, yeah. so the little girl, she, she basically asked, how can I get involved? I want to do something at my age and in the community. Whoa, my charger fell. (laughs) So I looked at her and I, of course, she's tearing up as she's trying to get the words out. She's tearing up. I looked at her and I said, oh, please don't do this to me right now. You're going to make me cry. And so I was like, I stopped and we both stopped and I looked at her mom and I was like, can I give you a hug? And she's like, yeah. So we just sat there and like, literally, I just said a prayer in my head and I hugged her and you're going to make me cry even sharing this story. But then I thought of my daughter and like, she's my daughter's age and knowing what we know about human trafficking and knowing that she, as young as she is, wants to step in the fight before any and most adults. And it's like the children shouldn't have to be fighting this but knowing that she wants to educate her friends so they can be leaders on their campus and empower them and knowing red light rebellion empowers the children. And so we shared that moment. And then I looked at her and I said, you know, the hotline is a lot mental health wise. I looked at her mom and said, mental health wise, absolutely no way. Now if she wants to come and sit with you and sit in prayer. That's going to be a conversation you guys have to have, but I said, don't let your age discourage you because there's so many things. So then I gave her red light rebellions information. She got in contact with them on how to get them in her campus because she's out of private school. And then fire, I sent her with Jessica. And I said, do you like making bracelets, you and your friends? Maybe you guys could get a group together to make bracelets for survivors. And so I told the mom, like, this is what they do. They take these into strip clubs and this is what this organization does. I'll get you connected directly to the person who runs it. 
So we walked over and I personally introduced her to Jessica and everyone over there and the survivor that spoke. And I said, this is the bracelets. This is what they do. Now I'll let her finish telling you. And then you guys can make that decision of what you're okay with what your daughter's doing. Yeah. And so then I shared a couple of people with her, but just seeing her come up to me and ask that, cause they were kind of waiting for, they weren't sure. Like, who do I ask? And I was like, do you guys need help or do you have questions? Mm-hmm. And so just hearing her and then seeing her cry, trying to even get the words out. I was like, don't do this. I know, <laughs> so, right? But, I, but that's how impactful they, it is. They are going to change this world. I fully Absolutely. believe that. I've said it. I have video evidence in my podcast that I've said it before. That they are, this group is going to change the world. And it's for numerous reasons. Because they've seen their parents stand up in the midst of all of this BS. And they know that they're not willing to listen, no matter where they go to school. They're not listening to all of the crap. Doesn't mean they're disrespectful. It means we're not doing it anymore. The other part about it is they are probably the most understanding, open, aware group of kids that are out there. They understand what mental health is. They understand what trauma is. They understand what that everybody is different and everyone has a right to be different no matter what. And so as you watch these chat boxes, I can't, I I can't can't do that. No, 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 no. Like there's a level where you're not a human. That's a problem. If you're going to the bathroom in a cat box and barking or meowing, that's a different situation altogether. Um, And I found out that there's a girl going into the boy's bathroom at school and I'm not yet sure how to handle that situation, but it's, It's this idea that I am willing to listen to your story, even if I don't agree with it, I will respect you, but I am not going to let you cross this line into my space, which is currently happening because there are too many adults that are too afraid to speak up and say, this is not happening in my space. And so to watch these kids come to these events learn about this stuff. Maybe it's, maybe it's school board meetings. Maybe it's events like this. Maybe it's walks, whatever it is and get called by God to say, I need you to step into this. And them being so young and parents who have, have, I wanted to say trained. That's not the word I was looking for. Have given them a life where they feel comfortable being themselves, where they talk God and they talk being good people and they talk about what's right they already know how to fall into that space whereas like you or I it's taken years and we're in our 30s and 40s to be like oh that's what it means to be who I'm meant to be and we're looking at these kids who are only in their teens and yeah they may not know what they want to do for a living in the in the sense of a job but you can already see them being called to be whatever God needs them to be. And it is the coolest thing to have a front row seat to, because yeah. again, like my boys, they're like, no, I don't fear. no fear at yeah. all. Fearless. Yeah. And it's so quick story. Cause we'll go on forever with this, but like <laughs> my older son, he's a sophomore now. And to see him like mature in a lot of this stuff like you know him he's a big goonball but he there's been a couple things at school that have happened that I'm like holy shit if you're like this at 15 you are going to be amazing as a grown man so for example there's one kid in his school he has a deformity on his hand this same kid made fun of Peyton in middle school so of course now this kid's a freshman Peyton's a sophomore he's like oh shit here I go again this numb nut is back yeah. And he was making fun of this other kid, kid with the deformity was making fun of the other kid. Of course, that kid had to make fun of him and call out his deformity. And then Peyton looks at him and goes, do you really make fun of kids just because you have a deformity on your hand? And this kid goes, well, yeah. And Peyton goes, you know, you don't have to do that. And of course the kid got mad and was like, well, I can do whatever I want. And Peyton's like, yeah, you can, but you don't have to. And like walked away. And I was like, holy shit, who are you? And what'd you do with my son? And then even just last night, he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing at band and whatever and got yelled at. But the other kid he was with got yelled at. And he's like, 
no, no, that was on me. I was talking. He wasn't doing anything. I'll take the blame for this one. And I was like, what the hell? And so I said to him, I was like, I like who this is. This is integrity. This doesn't mean that you don't mess up. This doesn't mean that you aren't mean to people. This doesn't mean any of that. But I love that you're like, nope, I'm going to take ownership for the shit I've done wrong. But I'm also going to hold you accountable for the stuff that you're doing that's not okay. And I was like, that's what we're raising. Like, these are the kids we're raising because we're able to sit in our discomfort. And so it's like, it's interesting to see where our three end up in the next. Absolutely. And even just touching back really quick, um, just because we did end like with kids and there was like one part with my, my daughter, there was all the TikTok episodes oh, yes. and Whitney. That's kind of where that situation left off. And then of course, a yeah, whole right? lot blew. but to see where she is from then mm-hmm. till now is a major transformation. Yeah. And so even just like from the schooling and her friends, but then also like when she was going to youth group, it would have been this past summer. Well, towards the end of the year, one day when we were going to youth group at the church. And again, for those of you who are just now catching up before I never forced her to go to youth group. I was just like, Hey, they have it. If you want to go bring a friend and I'll drive you guys. It went from one friend to now I'm carpooling like four of her friends. And then those four friends got the guy, their guy friends and my neighbor's son to go. And then next thing you know, like the mom ended up knowing the people who run the youth group at our church and the circle just got bigger. That's and cool. so now they, so, cool. so then now they spent like a lot of the time over there this past summer and now they're in the high school one, but, and now they all go together. But even just with that one night we were driving to youth group and we're driving past her old school and Becky knows anything of my whole situation more than anyone. So with that, there's eventually maybe I'll come out on a podcast later, but, um, With that is just knowing like she went from burner phone hiding stuff to her old school. She was there for sports, but it was again, LDS school, not LDS, but she went there for sports. It was very cult like. And so the mindset and the values were completely different than what we go by. But again, with that situation is trying to break the programming. So she always heard our podcasting and everything, but there was a lot of projection onto me because I wasn't doing what the cool parents were doing. And I shared even like music breakdown. So go back and listen to those episodes. But even seeing that transformation, when we were driving past her school and her friends are in the backseat and she's telling her friends, like, I was such a bad kid. Like I left this school because this and this. And so she's like, I was such a bad kid and this is what I did and my mental health. And we were talking about suicide and how at points like in 2021 ish or no, 2022, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it without going to jail this year. Like, (laughs) right. It was rough. I called Gilbert PD like to help me. It was a rough rough. year. (laughs) But you handled it. You handled it (laughs) so well, like knowing what you know and the interesting thing about it, and not that I ever want to use your story as like a a thing, but it can happen to anybody. We have a freaking podcast and it was happening to you. Yeah, we have a podcast and it was happening to me and it was more of the rebellion. And so then having to go back and luckily we had like everyone we worked with to know the red flags and to have resources to say, this is what's happening, or here's an outlet. So when it came to like the suicide stuff, um, with that situation, so just hearing her friends talk about now she's opening up to them and telling them like from the suicide to like everything she was going through and just admitting how she was a bad kid. And, and again, now mind you, she made the decision to go to youth group and to join the one day at school where they meet and it's a Christian school. And so that where they go and do that together at school and have mentorship there. 
So knowing that she was making all those decisions where everybody, even family was like, well, why are you putting her there? Why wouldn't you put her in a public school? Why wouldn't you put her at a big school? Why are you making this decision? So to even like battle me on that, I'm like, okay. And then to get a card back from her friends and just thanking even me for being there. I think it was on mother's day or my birthday. One of the two like that. Yeah. Something like that for thanking me for even just being there for them and always being present. And so then just seeing that and then seeing her transformation and then taking them all to youth group and just hearing her say, basically, mom, I'm sorry, I was a bad kid. And then knowing like, look, everyone, like even family, I had to sit everyone down, give them a human trafficking grooming 101 session. And I force everyone to sit in a room and say, I'm not masking it. This is what's going on at work. I literally went into work and said, I'm not masking it anymore. Narcissist abuse, mental health, blah, blah, blah. Everyone, everyone got it. Everyone so, heard Bridget that month. <laughs> everyone heard the mean side of me. It was, it's not even me. It was just like, I'm done masking it. And I'm not going to sit here and try to function through it while people are comfortable. I'm not going to do that. And so it's been amazing seeing like what, like, even though you have your relationship with God and you walk in your faith, trying to balance it, but still like kind of adapt to society. But then when you have literally no compromise and like, nope, we're doing this full out and surrender, like your life changes completely. And I will say the, the 43 days of not eating in the spiritual growth did wonders because man, that set so many boundaries and barriers of like, I had them there, but now it's just like, nope, this is what it is. Love me or hate me either way. I'm going to show you love and grace. Bye. (laughs) Don't care either. I'm going to show you love and grace in my circle, or I'm going to show you love and grace from across the room, but either way, (laughs) this is where we're at. Absolutely. So again, like I thank you to everyone for constantly the love, the support, the prayers. We, we see those come in as well. And without where we started and without all of you being with us on this journey and sharing survivor stories, like we, our podcast would not be where it is today without all of you. So genuinely, we love you and thank you so much. And thank you all glory to God for leading people to our path and on this journey. Amen. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, I think that was the best way to do it. And we'll, again, like we said, we'll come back. We'll come back when we have time to come back and when we have something we want to talk about. So um, there's 90 episodes for you to catch up on in between us uh, (laughs) here and there. But we're, this was, this was fun. I'm glad we got to get back and we got to talk about what we've been doing and where we've been. Um, There's lots of things that we could talk about. So I'm sure we'll come up with something additional but this has been cool thank you thanks to all of our listeners as well yeah and if you guys have anything that you want to know about or learn about one thing with us is when it comes to healing mental health or advocacy we're very transparent in that aspect as well in everything that we do um so we're open to talk about anything unsugarcoated and we don't sugarcoat anything So again, just let us know if there's like anything that you guys want to see or know more about, especially even when it comes to human trafficking, Uh, especially so many people are speaking out on human trafficking right now. And again, it is not a trend. It is a reality that has that trauma and those life situations. There's human souls attached to that. There's children currently being sacrificed at the border there or even in their own homes. and in the community so again just be aware be mindful and if you're going to speak out on human trafficking or trauma be trauma informed please be mindful because if not it does it does a lot of damage to the anti-human trafficking movement because then we have to go back now and educate on those pieces and it just take it's already hard to get people to grasp human trafficking right and to understand that but now even with things like sound of freedom and causing that division um 
that is hard because so many people are not focused on the kids and the overall message. Yep. They're so focused on the messengers and yes. the people behind it, which yep. we do not support any of that, but we support the message and the awareness of it. So again, if you have any questions or you want to learn more on human trafficking, we will gladly provide resources or visit Becky's uh, little beautiful PDF on right. standby survivors. And that has an intro of human trafficking and our website standby survivors.com is a great book of knowledge as well. Amen. But, yeah. So again, change starts with awareness. When does it stop? When each and every single one of us have the courage to stop looking away and turning a blind eye, you don't get to look the other way on this issue. Human trafficking is a $150 billion industry. Put down your smart devices and listen to your children, family, or friends. The world is hurting. We all have a duty to protect the innocent. If we don't, that blood is on our hands. Everyone has a story. Together, we must rise up for the children. It starts with one person. It starts with you. We want to take a moment and hold space for those dealing with mental health, adversity in their life, those who are just waking up to this, those who were abused sexually, mentally, domestically, and those who had their innocence stolen from them by the corrupt system, such as CPS, foster care, in your own family, a trusted adult figure, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a loved one, whoever it may be, know that you are strong, you are beautiful, you are enough. We are so sorry for everything you've endured. You have a powerful voice. And we pray one day that God gives you the strength when you're ready to speak, to stand in your truth and continue to shine the light and be true to who you are. Never let anyone dim that light. Know we are here for you and you are not alone. If we can just take a brief moment of silence. We will be the generation to end human trafficking. Enough is enough. Survivors, we see you, we hear you, we stand by you. Sending you love, light, and blessings. Take your candle and go light the world. Love, Save Our Children podcast.